So we'll look at the map. We see the Japanese task force, codenamed M, has been holding a position just north of Koko Peninsula. What they don't know is that a submarine operating under Operational X-1 has been sending their location to the British Task Force, which has been positioning itself to attack. The Japanese Task Force has sent their submarine, Ho, which can launch reconnaissance aeroplane, south, trying to find the British battle group, and coincidentally they have missed each other. And so, on the morning of the 26th, as the sun is just peeking over the horizon, the Japanese launch their dawn patrol of Zeros, and they're looking forward to a boring patrol, as the enemy is nowhere near. However, they are quickly jumped by British fighters, Fulmers, three squadrons in fact, and we'll take the story up from there. Now that the Japanese Zeros have been swept from the sky, the squadrons of British dive bombers, the Suckers, come in to attack Kaga. The Japanese carrier's defence against air attack is to do a hard turn either to port or starboard and circle, hoping to throw off the aim of the attacking aircraft. The first squadron of suckers attacked. Two were shot down on the way in, but three hits were made on the carrier deck. Two penetrated below and caused fires in the hangar. The second squadron of suckers attacked. The first plane was shot down. They achieved three hits on the carrier and no casualties on the way out. The third squadron of suckers attacked. They took the attack all the way down. Two were shot down on the way in and they completely missed the carrier. One casualty on the way out. Kager's damage has reduced its speed to 17 knots, which makes it a better target for the torpedo planes. Here come the string bags, so called because they were made of timber, covered in canvas and held together by wire. Their double wing gave them an excellent lift capacity, which made them excellent carrier torpedo bombers. Obsolete by the beginning of World War II, they were all the British had, and provided there were no enemy aircraft around, they could do the job. Let's see if they do. Kager had been hit by six aerial bombs from the Sucker dive bombing squadrons 
and four torpedoes from the string bags in brackets swordfish three on the starboard side and one in the rear the crew could not fight the fires below decks and repair the torpedo damage Kaga slowed to a halt settled in the water listed to starboard and then sank beneath the waves The remaining squadron of string bags now turned their attention to Muto and went into the attack. Muto, however, had two heavy destroyers as escorts and when they saw the attack planes approaching, they immediately turned to try and cut them off and add their anti-aircraft fire. Torpedo has caused an oil leak in Muto, but I suspect that will be fairly quickly fixed, and the steering appears not to have been too badly damaged by the torpedo. The fighters are the first to return to the carrier, and unfortunately, three of them have to ditch. The next to return to the carrier are the Sucker Dive Bombing Squadrons, and from all of those, two of them ditch. And finally, the string bags return. Of the two squadrons, there are five remaining and they all land safely. As the battleships now approach each other, Muto, Rodney and Royal Oak, HMS Rodney will have a spotter plane supplied by HMS Ajax. HMS Royal Oak will use the walrus spotting plane from HMS Exeter. Muto is the first to get off a ranging shot. Long. Royal Oak now replies with her ranging shot. It also is called over. Now Muto fires a full broadside. Two hits on the superstructure, but the 16 inch shells from Muto will not penetrate the 13 inches of armour down the side of Royal Oak at this range. Royal Oak returns her first salvo at Muto. They are all long, but not by much. Muto fires her second salvo. And they miss, but not by much. Royal Oak returns the favour with her second salvo. They also are long. The battleships are now converging on each other. They are 18 miles apart and they're looking for that killer knockout salvo. It does make it hard for the spotting planes though when the targets are changing their location all the time. This is the third salvo. Dangerously close, but another miss. Third salvo for Royal Oak and her spotting plane, Supermarine Walrus from HMS Ajax, is also having the same problems. Well, look at that, four hits on the superstructure of Muto. Unfortunately, at this range, the 15 inch shells from Royal Oak will not penetrate the armor belt of Muto, but it does rearrange some superstructure. The range is closed to 16 miles, still over the horizon. Muto fires her fourth broadside. Another near miss. Royal Oak fires her fourth broadside. As these two ships are merging towards each other, it is affecting their accuracy. The range has closed to 14 miles and they are entering the lethal distance. And what I mean by that is get a tape measure and measure 13 inches. That is the thickness of the armor belt that runs down the side of these ships, pure hardened steel. And yet their shells at 14 miles will now be able to punch through that if they hit at the right angle. And I almost spoke too soon. Royal Oak receives five hits in the salvo, but luckily none of them have penetrated inside to do any real damage. Royal Oak returns her fifth broadside and misses. Meanwhile, Ark Royal 
is launching her two squadrons of sucker dive bombers. The distance is now closed to 12 miles and Muto fires her sixth broadside. And misses. Royal Oak returns her sixth broadside and actually scores one hit on Muto but it does not penetrate. The range is now closed to 11 miles and this will be the seventh broadside from Muto. This latest straddle from Mutu has really caused some damage to Royal Oak. The bridge has been put out of action and one of the shells has penetrated into the boiler room, destroying the boilers, causing all sorts of damage, fire and chaos. The ship is slowing to a stop. Royal Oak has one last salvo left in her. This last straddle from Royal Oak hit the Muto four times and one of the shots actually has destroyed the bridge on Muto. So with no bridge, Muto turns away from the fight, not realizing the dire straits that Royal Oak is in. And to add to her woes on the horizon are squadrons of sucker dive bombers approaching. Muto's anti-aircraft fire starts up, but it's only at 75% effectiveness because of all the battle damage. Three attack planes have been shot down on the way in. They've achieved two hits and one miss, but there was no real penetration damage. Now the second squadron go in for the attack. One hit, two misses. And returning to the carrier, the dive bombers have been badly shot up and one ends up ditching. Ark Royal now has a total complement of 17 fighters, three dive bombers and five torpedo planes remaining. But what of the battleships? Muto has turned away from the action with her bridge destroyed. The battleship is now completely in the control of a lieutenant. The second main gun turret is out of action. Her anti-aircraft guns are down to 50% and she is limping at 12 knots. Royal Oak has managed to put out and do some emergency repairs to her boilers and is now able to cruise at 13 knots. Her anti-aircraft guns are only 75% effective. She needs to go home for repairs. But what of HMS Rodney while Muto and Royal Oak have been battling? At the beginning of the engagement, the commander of Muto ordered his four light destroyers and one heavy destroyer to do a bonsai charge on HMS Rodney to push the battleship away from the engagement. Between these four light destroyers and one heavy destroyer, they have a total of 33 long lance torpedoes. Each one is a ship killer with a 490 kg warhead. Extremely long range and because it's not compressed air driven it doesn't leave a trail of bubbles to be avoided. The smart move for Rodney is to turn away from these destroyers and try and keep them at a distance. However her speed is only 23 knots and the destroyers closing is 34 knots. Rodney has called in Exeter to help add to the gunfire. Rodney and Exeter open fire. Between them, they have 14 six inch guns. Their first to fourth solvers miss, but on the fifth, they score two hits. On their sixth solvo, a massive 10 hits. 
Sagagi is out of action. The target then shifts to the furthest destroyer on the left. The 7th and 8th Solvos miss, but on the 9th there are 8 hits and one of those shells penetrates down into the magazine and explodes. The target then moves inwards to the next destroyer. The 10th and 11th Solvos miss, but on the 12th there are a massive 12 hits with two penetrations and again another magazine explosion. The target again shifts to the right. The 13th and 14th Solvos miss, but the 15th Solvo has nine hits and five of those penetrate into the ship. The boiler room is damaged, the steering is locked to port and there is massive internal damage. This ship is out of action. The last destroyer, Azakazi, in sheer frustration turns hard to port and launches her six long lance torpedoes. Then, behind a thick oily smoke screen, she retires from the action. The long lance torpedoes cannot be seen coming until it's way too late. Luckily, they all missed. Rodney and Exeter will dare not follow through this thick oily smoke screen as they do not know what possible ambush awaits them on the other side. The action is over. Exeter, keeping well out of range, moves around and finishes off the two badly damaged Japanese destroyers. Okay, so I'd just like to go through a couple of points that I hope will you find of interest. And the first one is the naval tactic of crossing the T and why ships did it. If we look at the board here, we'll see ship A and ship B and they're crossing the T, as you can see, the T. Now the advantage to ship A is this, all her guns can fire at the enemy. And the shells will be landing on the deck of ship B, which is the thinnest armor on a ship. Ship B in return can only fire her front guns and they are firing at the belt armor of A, which is the thickest part of a ship's armor. Ship A will generally always come out well ahead in this type of engagement. And that's why in Navy terms, crossing the T is an excellent position for a ship to be in. Now, how old is this tactic? Well, here's a picture of ships during the Roman Greek era, galleys. And you can see that they're crossing the T because they ram each other to sink the other ship. And that is the earliest form of crossing the T. Today, with modern missiles and whatnot else, ships fairly rarely get into that closer range to do this. And that um, brings me to the next thing I want to talk about is range. If you stand on the shore and look out to sea, you'll see about five miles. If you go up into the lookout of a battleship, that horizon's extended roughly 12, maybe a bit more. If you're relying on that to target your enemy ship, then you're way too close and his shells can penetrate you and do some real damage. You want to keep that other ship as far away as possible, but still where you're damaging it. And so spotter planes come into play. Now, uh, Japanese ships all carried spotter planes, whereas a lot of British ships didn't. Uh, they relied on their heavy cruisers that had the spotter planes on them. And there's a pros and cons for both of this because to recover a spotter plane, the ship has to stop. The plane lands next to it, crane picks it up, puts it on the ship. Which would you rather have stopping? Your major asset, and you know, there could be submarines around and other ships picking up a spotter plane or a heavy cruiser. So, you know, there's pros and cons for both. The British ships had to have the cruisers go with them everywhere they went, uh, whereas the Japanese carried theirs with them. Now, let's just take a quick look at the ship in the latest action, Rodney. There's a sister ship to Rodney called the Nelson. Look at the guns on the ship, they're all in the front. So if this ship were crossed, being crossed at the T at the back, she'd be in a spot of bother. But that's not really likely to happen with the ranges they fought at. In this instance, where the Japanese destroyers were coming on fast from the rear, 
this ship was sailing away. She has six turrets with two six inch guns in each turret and they can deliver, as you saw, a massive amount of firepower at ranges that still are further than what the guns on the destroyers could fire back. You don't want to use your front main guns to shoot at destroyers. It's like trying to swat a fly with a sledgehammer. You might end up doing it, but it's not effective. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope that um, explains some points uh, of what's been going on just recently. Let's get on with it. So while that naval engagement was taking place north of Coco Peninsula, uh, Force E has headed for Harbour Ambon and has almost reached there. The two submarines designated Force X for the British are cruising towards Tory Harbour. Force H for the British has returned to Barracuda Bay for rearming, refueling and a spot of rest. And the Japanese Force A has headed home towards Tory Harbour, not realising they're sailing in parallel with two British submarines just over the horizon. And that's the 26th drawing to a close. Let's look and see what happens on the 27th. But first, are there any intelligence reports coming in?